Hi guys, thanks thanks for joining this call. Uh, I would give you a couple of more minutes to you know to to give opportunity other participants also join this call, and we will start basically our talk. Okay. Okay. So, uh, guys, if uh, if someone is first time uh, on bug out uh, meetups, just uh, want to give you some context. We we'll try to keep things uh, very casual, and you know, if uh, during the presentation you have questions, feel free to post them either on chat or after the presentation you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly. So we. You know, we want to make this as valuable as possible for, for everyone. So feel free to ask your questions. Okay, uh, I think we can start our uh, presentation. Uh, our guest is uh, Huey Liu, uh, who is a professor uh, at the University at Buffalo, and he is also leading the lab of uh, media forensics. And today he will share about deep fakes. You know, as um, always in life, it's, you know, yin and yang, right? There's <laughs> good things and bad things. And uh, we last uh, last uh, time we uh, we had a guest, Artyom, who was talking about how he's using deep fakes uh, to create digital humans and sort of like a good use case, like positive use case, how you uh, use that technology. But, uh, you know, at the same time, technology could be used for, you know, bad purposes and by bad actors, all right? And in this case, uh, deep fakes, they are being used to generate fake uh, news and, you know, spread misleading information. And, uh, Today, our talk will be dedicated to, you know, how to fight against uh, like uh, bad actors, right, and uh, and fake news. Thanks a lot, Xiuwei, for finding time and join our community and share, you know, your knowledge and what you've been working on. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Sophia. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think the exactly as what Sophia mentioned, uh, this technology itself is very neutral. Um, and, and, you know, even though we talk about the negative impact of defects, we'll also pay attention to the positive uses. Um, but let me just start my talk uh, with a quick introduction of the kind of problem we're dealing with. OK, um, so the past few years, of course, you know, we have seen that like uh, very fast development of um, our computation infrastructure, especially those uh, graphical processing units, GPUs. Um, and uh, we have seen a widespread and deep reach of social media, various kind of uh, social media platforms. Um, and um, we also have, you know, huge development in artificial intelligence and machine learning, especially deep learning. And then we have the open open source um, software development quite a lot, which is, uh, you know, one uh, one thing that is you know drawing uh, uh, users to this community particularly, um, and 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 all this development are you know uh, prepare for the ground for a breakthrough, and that happened basically in uh, in the in the in the past few years, um, the end of twenty seven with. Uh, uh, 2017, we started to see this phenomenon that we call deepfakes. Okay, and roughly speaking, deepfakes are AI synthesized or manipulated media. So I'm going to show you a few examples of, you know, well-known examples of deepfakes to just give you an idea. You know what we can do, what what it can be, uh, what they can do, and uh, uh, how they were roughly um, how they look like. Um, so, uh, for instance, we we all we we now sort of see all this realistic looking human faces, um, and uh, they they have they represent a very high level of details in their skins, in their uh, fine details of their uh, their their face, and even hair. 
but it turns out that all these images were actually created using an algorithm, uh, an algorithm known as generative adversarial network, or GAN, uh, for short. And they all they correspond to uh, people, uh, to humans that do not exist um, as as real as real humans. So um, you can actually go to um, your go to this website called "This Person Does Not Exist," and you can find a lot of these samples. Um, for this kind of realistic synthetic human faces. Now, this kind of faces, this kind of images are being again misused. As, as I talk, you know, um, I, would, I, I would talk about the positive uses of some of this uh, media, but what got them the most attention from people across the world are their potential uh, negative uses. So we have recent report that you know the uh, there are fake social accounts set up by uh, online trolls, um, and to actually make those accounts look more realistic, they actually use human faces as profiles. Initially, they use real human faces. They you know borrow from other uh, online platforms, and it turns out that it's quite easy to find the real uh, real account based on matching face images. So they now turn to gen generated images, and on LinkedIn. Um, they, they have found like hundreds of this kind of, um, actually is a very conservative estimate, hundred, uh, more than a couple of hundreds of this kind of accounts that are using um, this GAN generated images as their profile uh, photos. And, and they become very deceptive. And you, as you can see, one of these fake accounts actually got 49 actions who are real people. Um, so um, the other kind of um, uh, fake, media faultry we can make with um, uh, AI algorithms are audios. So what I'm showing you here is a, a synthetic video plus audio, but you can you can hear yourself. Uh, the synthetic Today, itself. I'd like to overview the exciting field of deep reinforcement learning, introduce overview and provide you some of the basics. I think it's one of the most exciting fields in artificial intelligence. It's marrying the power and the ability of the deep neural network. Right, so this is uh, a synthetic voice of former president, US president of Barack Obama, talking about definition of reinforced learning. So I'm sure that topic he has never talked about, he probably know very little about it. We're very, very interested in this, but but we can make that presence as if he was, uh, you know, he was talking about that, uh, he was giving a, a lecture on that topic. Um, and this kind of uh, falsified sound, synthetic sound, can also be used in the negative way. Uh, there was actually a report last year, um, uh, well, actually a couple of years, uh, two years ago, um, one of such synthetic voice was used to um, um, uh, disguise as the CEO's voice and, and, and uh, a bank employee actually following this, the instructions given by the falsified sound to wire transfer a big sum of money uh, to a foreign account. So this is actually, uh, to my best knowledge, this is actually one of the first incidents where this kind of AI synthesized media caused serious financial losses to some business. Um, and I think what gave the name deepfake are those famous face swap videos. Um, so what I'm showing you here um, are you know on the, the 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 video on the left is the is the real one, um, and you probably recognize is the face of actor Brad Pitt. And on the right, there are four videos, uh, all sort of simulating the same facial expression and head movement as in the original real video, but they're with different faces. And um, these faces were actually all synthesized with AI algorithm with deep learning, uh, deep neural network models, and then spliced back into the original video and with uh, careful post-processing um, for a casual look it's very hard to tell apart you know which one is real and which one's fake um, and we can push this to limit where not only we we just replace the face part we can actually synthesize the whole head and upper body like the example i shown here so this kind of uh, uh, falsified video are also uh, people also call them face pop tree. Um, so the one on the left is the real video, and the one on the right is synthesized by an algorithm trained on uh, um, that subject, uh, videos of that, uh, the subject uh, 
uh, shown there. So you can see that you know the uh, the synthesized video almost perfectly simulate the facial e expression and emotion of the real from the real video, and that can be used to uh, this kind of video driven uh, synthesis can be used to create more realistic effects um, and, and be used in um, on the social uh, on social media. So we're actually feeling the uh, the real damages caused by this kind of uh, falsified media. Uh, one of the biggest problem is known as revenge pornography. Uh, this is where you know people take faces, take images, uh, uh, take faces of former spouse, uh, spouses or girlfriends, and and you know most of the victims I I know of were actually women uh, in this kind of cases, um, and they generate uh, fake pornographic videos with the victim's face planted in. And that can cause tremendous psychological and emotional stress to the victim. Um, I know this because I was involved in one of the actual cases um, a few years ago as an expert witness. And uh, I can testify, you know, this, this is really a, a huge problem, even though the video itself may not have be a very high quality uh, video, um, the damage caused by the victim could still be very um, uh, significant. Um, and also, this kind of video can be used as a tool of propagation, uh, propaganda and uh, spread messages, um, uh, falsify the messages or disinformation. Um, and there was a study um, by this uh, company, by, by the company Sensity AI, showing that the deepfake, the number of deep, online deepfakes um, is already pretty large. And the trend is by every uh, six months, the number of such videos doubles. And 90, more than a, a dominating share, like more than 95% of those videos are actually pornographic in nature. So it's, um, it's we're, we're seeing a trend of this kind of falsified media uh, coming at scale with a large number um, and, um, and, and easier to make. So, so that, that is a, really a problem we need to uh, we need to take seriously, and and I think the worst thing the the, the most fundamental damage that this kind of falsified media caused to us is is that they blur the line between what is real and what is not, and actually generate this kind of general disbelief of anything you know um, on on social media, and and that's kind of poisonous to the to the current information ecosystem. Um, but I, I, I do need to mention that, you know, this kind of uh, uh, technologies by themselves are really not good or evil intrinsically. Um, it's like any technology uh, we have, like a nuclear technology, you know, on, on one side we can make, you know, the atomic bombs, all of that, uh, mass uh, destruction uh, weapons, all of that. On the other side, we can also use it for, you know, generating power. So. It, it's not whether it's good or bad doesn't depend on the technology itself. It's really about you know how we use it, who are using it, and for what purpose what, what purpose they are used. Um, and I will say in in this particular case, um, uh, this kind of technology, the fact that we can use machine learning and neural networks to create realistic human faces, uh, images and videos of human faces and and human voices is one of the crown jewel of the current AI technology. And we should be actually proud of, of this development. And there are positive uses, um, like in, in, in movie industry, in advertisement, or even in rehabilitation, you know, people with language um, uh, disorders or uh, problems could use this kind of synthetized, synthetic technology to help to make them, uh, 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 to, to, you know, to help them. But on the other hand, you know, this negative use also, you know, quite outweighed this positive use. So that's absolutely something we should take seriously and uh, develop technologies to uh, mitigate. So, so that's that leads to the topic of uh, my work. Um, so, and uh, this is the general area I'm working in is is known as media forensics or. Uh, uh, sometimes multimedia forensics or digital media forensics. But the general idea is, you know, since manipulation of media become, become so easy with the help of AI and software tools, uh, there must be a counter 
measure to all this manipulation so that we can reestablish some trust and uh, confidence for uh, in all those medias we, we've seen online. So uh, put very simply, you know, one of the straightforward tasks for uh, uh, multimedia forensics in the case of deep fakes is uh, detection technology. So put very, very simply, what we want to do is, you know, come up with any piece of media, you know, be it an image or an audio or a video. We want to have a model, we want to have a method or an algorithm or a system where we input this media in and the algorithm will give us some answers about whether this is an authentic, untouched, original media or it, it has been manipulated in certain ways. For instance, generated by an AI model or you know manipulated from the original ones. So, so typically this, this, this problem is formulated as a classification problem where you know we train another deep neural network model, input those images and try to uh, get an answer from the models. And, um, and, and treating it as a classification problem means that you know we reduce all this media into some space where we can find a clear separation surface between the real samples and the fake samples. And that classifier just answer the question which side an unknown sample falls in and give us an answer to that. And um, um, mo most frequently, the classification happen in in a, another representation of the raw data because you know the pixels and 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 the wave samples from images and audios are not necessarily the best representation to perform this kind of task. So usually there's a step of extracting extracting something we call the features that can represent the differences, fundamental differences between original and synthetic media. And then train our classifier in that space and eventually um, uh, separate them out um, using the classification surface. Um, so roughly speaking, there are uh, several different categories of these kind of algorithms. Uh, the most uh, popular, I will say, dominating trend of methods are based on uh, training machine learning deep deep neural network models. Um, they're data driven methods, um, but they're also uh, uh, many Q based methods. So this the data driven method based just take the image in and let the model figure out what are the good features and how to separate them out in different uh, using different classification models. The Q based models, on the other hand, you know look for specific uh, artifacts in those in based on the understanding of the generation process and uh you know twin models are specifically looking for that kind of artifacts and then make decision based on that okay um so my work covers across all this different branch of methods so i don't really have a lot of time to go into details of any specific method but i want to give you an overview and maybe just a little taste uh what this method looks like and and then if you're interested you know uh we can have a follow-up discussion so let's start with the data-driven methods. Um, so these kind of methods are typically uh, quite straightforward in the sense that you know you basically collect a lot of data, and then you decide, uh, and we decide a, a model structure, a deep neural network architecture, and then we just train the model using a super uh, in a supervised learning fashion. So we give the labels, we give the input, and make the model uh, try to. Um, uh, uh, improve, the, uh, improve the model's ability to give the right answer. So throughout the years, uh, we have seen many, many different deep neural network model um, being applied here, and they are generally speaking quite successful. Um, so in, in just you know, for the special example of uh, those kind of deep fake videos, uh, face swapping videos, um, the state of art of detection algorithms, the state of art performance is actually achieved with this data-driven models. So, um, and, and they are in the ballpark if we talk about accuracy, not, not in you know, you know, specific type of uh, evaluation metrics, they're mostly in the 85, between 85 and 90, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more than 90% of accuracy in that ballpark area. So they are you know, not 100% accuracy, but that's okay because you know these algorithms, we use them mostly as, a kind of fast filtering, uh, triaging approaches. So that's fine. Um, so that performance range is actually satisfactory. 
Um, and, and correspondingly, there are a lot of, you know, because we need big data set to train those models. There are quite a few um, uh, data sets for the training and the evaluation purposes. Um, and, uh, and also uh, Facebook uh, have sponsored a global challenge on deepfake detection, which comes with a large scale data set. Um, in terms of the um, deepfake data set, my lab provides one of the most uh, widely used data set, uh, high quality face swapping videos uh, called SilabDF. Um, so if you're interested, you can you can Google and check it out. Um, so it's it's available for anyone who's interested in this line of research. So um, uh, the uh, the problem now now we were actually um, so the data driven approaches are actually uh, quite effective as I mentioned, but they're they're general. There are some general limitations for this type of uh, algorithms. First of all, you know the, the the one of the known problem with the deep this kind of data driven approach is is they're mostly a black box model. So you have a deep neural network uh, model that can do well on classification uh, on on, the, on on classifying real and fake media, but it doesn't really tell you why. Um, so once you got those results, it's very hard to know uh, what happened there, why this model made that decision. And uh, so, so this, this kind of answer may be fine if we just want to filter out some easy cases, but it would not be okay if we want to use this as a basis for investigation. So, that, and, and, and the other thing is if it's a black box, we cannot 100% trust whatever the results come out of it because we don't understand it. The other problem is they are also, they tend to also be very fragile. Um, so they're fragile with post-processing. Uh, for instance, for the, in the case of videos, if we downsample the video, we, you know, adding a little bit of noise, we blur it, uh, even recompress it, um, uh, it will change the performance of the classification uh, in a fairly drastic way. So, um, they, they, they're not particularly adapt to the real life post-processing operations for those uh, for, on, on the data. And more importantly, they are very vulnerable to intentional attack. So in machine learning, there's a new branch called adversarial attack where you take a deep neural network model uh, and, and we can design, you can design special noises, noise patterns inbound in your uh, media and then the same, uh, the perturbed media put into the classifier, the classifier will make a complete opposite uh, prediction. So, so those kind of problems are mostly, um, um, we, I, I believe, originated from the fact that, you know, this is a, um, uh, a kind of um, 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 black box model. We don't understand, you know, what, what, what is happening inside that black box. So uh, the alternative approach is, um, is this, uh, we call it a queue-based model. So uh, there are several things we can use as queues. Um, so the first one uh, we, that explored in one of um, my early work is this uh, at the signal level. Um, because when we generating fake media, many times those um, uh, frames are put into, uh, many of the, the synthetic media when we created will actually leave some invisible traces, but can be exposed when we use choose the right tools in the signal uh, uh, in the signal domain. So just kind of making an analogy is like an X-ray, right? So something we won't see with our naked eyes, but if we choose the right tools and following the, the trend, the, the, the root cause of the problem, we can expose those artifacts. So one thing we have um, identified as such kind of telltale cues for uh, face swap videos is the fact that when we generate the face, the synthetic faces, we need to splice it into the original video frame. And uh, that splicing operation and, and the subsequent post-processing to make the face blended in into the background and, and, and also the, the face images need to be resized and need to be rotated. All of this uh, operations actually leave specific type of signal artifacts. Not noticeable by human eyes, but if we train a model um, focusing on, you know, just looking for those kind of artifacts, uh, we can quite 
easily, you know, uh, expose, uh, reveal um, um, a, a fake media, a fake video that way. So that's one of our early work. Um, um, okay, sorry, just um, the slides is a little out of out of order. This so these are the limitations I talk about for the um, um, for the data data driven methods. Um, so so that's the signal level cues are useful, but they're still not as intuitive as we wish to wish them to have. So we also look for uh, cues based on uh, based more on uh, semantic, uh, more semantical, uh, uh, semantical, uh, semantic uh, features. So uh, I'll, I'll just quickly go through some of the recent work we did. One is uh, based on uh, physiological, uh, physical constraints. So here um, uh, I'm showing you two images. One is a real image. The other is an image created by the GAN model I showed earlier. So on the surface, both images look very realistic, very hard to tell which one is is real and which one is fake. But if we actually, so it turns out that the one on the left is real, the one on the right is fake. It turns out that if we, we actually look into the eyes of the two faces, we can notice that the reflections in the iris are different. For a real image, because the eyes are looking at the same scene, the reflections between the two eyes should, should be very similar to each other. On the other hand, for the fake images, the 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 reflections this this part of this kind of you know is some common sense for humans that when we look at the same scene the two eyes see exactly the same thing but this kind of simple common sense constraint is very hard to to be understood by a deep neural network model trained from data directly so that's why when they synthesize the images the um, the two eyes uh, often comes up with inconsistent um, patterns, reflection patterns in this case. So, you know, based on this hint, we can design a very simple algorithm, uh, just looking for those areas of reflections, compare them. If they are, you know, uh, similar, we think, we believe, you know, there's some evidence that this is real. Otherwise, if, if there's evidence suggesting that this may be a fake. Um, and we actually try on um, images we collected from uh, various uh, GAN models, uh, this method seems to be working pretty well. Of course, you know this could be fixed in the next generation of GAN models once they notice these artifacts. But I think this is, you know, this at least we started this uh, trend so that you know if they want to do this, um, I, I think that the, the way to, to the right way to, to put this is they can beat us, but they need to pay a higher price. So just reaching that threshold. Um, we can also look for um, uh, cues from physiological, from human biology. Again, looking into the eyes, another you know of uh, an, another set of cues uh, we found, which are very interesting, are the shape of the pupil. Um, the real human for real human eyes, the shape of the pupil are usually circular, um, and and they may be become elliptical because different viewing angles. But roughly speaking, um, the opening of the the pupil uh, is, is a perfect circle. Uh, but for GAN generated images, this is usually not the case. Um, and we, we, when we actually look for those boundaries, they always show some level, some degrees of irregularity. When we fit a, a circular shape to it, it's a huge deviation. So again, use that as a cue. Um, we can, we can we can we develop another simple detection algorithm, but right? just extracting the the iris part and compare the shape of the pupil, and then um, um, again it shows that a lot of the GAN generated images can be detected that way. Um, similar things happen for synthetic audio. Um, so we look for this this time we look for physical scene uh, again another kind of physical cues. So. Uh, uh, one thing we we notice is that you know the audios like like the audio samples I showed you early on is very hard to tell apart from uh, with our ears, um, but there is but there is some kind of beauty in physical and physiological um, um, phenomenon that will help us to tell the differences. So let me just give you a quick ex um, explanation what happened there. So when we are talking in a and you know, with a real human voice is 
object is created and being heard by the other human, um, the process is usually like this. Um, one person, the talker, you know, the sound come out of the talker's mouth and go into the listener's ears. But in real uh, natural environment, the sound does not come from one single path to the other person's ear. They actually bounce off from different environment, you know, walls, ceilings, and then reach the other person's ear. Okay. So what this means is that the sound wave we're hearing is not a single signal. It is actually a mixture of the same signal, but slightly shift in time a little bit because the different trajectory have different lengths. So they come to our ears at different time. Now this difference in arrival time appears into differences in the phases of those, um, those signals, okay? And, and so what are, we're hearing are actually same signal with different phases. But our, our auditory system, our neural, uh, neural, neural system, automatically discount those kind of uh, phase differences, which is understandable. If not, we're not going to hear anybody's conversation stably because what we're going to hear is a hodgepodge of signals mixing together, right? Um, so our auditory system discount that, but that, that, that difference in phases still exists. And this is what probably the generation algorithm didn't pay attention to. They synthesize uh, audio signals that are um, uh, has the right energy profile, but doesn't have the right phase profile. And uh, if we use, again, use the right tool, we are able to um, identify those kind of phase differences. And this is one of our, another of our uh, work uh, looking for this kind of phase differences in audio signal. Uh, we use a, a analysis, a mathematical analysis tool called the bispectral analysis and use this tool that are specifically sensitive to local phase differences, we can actually identify um, um, uh, those, those different, um, uh, different type of synthetic audios. Um, and uh, right, so, and, and then once we, we know, we use that set of features, just using a very simple classifier, we can do a fairly good job um, um, separating them. Um, and uh, this is one of our earliest work of detecting phase swapping videos. Again, all these videos, we, this is our the, the first generation of uh, uh, defect video, face swapping videos. Uh, you, you probably noticed that these are different people's faces, but was actually all replaced uh, with faces of Nicolas Cage. Um, and uh, one thing, so this is actually, uh, we developed this work like four months after the first face swapping uh, video show up online. And Again, we, we found this very intuitive and interesting artifacts in all these videos. Uh, and, and is that, you know, nobody, none of the face actually have a good eye blinking uh, in this kind of images. And uh, it turns out that this is again, a kind of uh, um, um, artifacts or a, a limitation of the model because the first round of training data they use are images they search on the internet. So if you do an image search for Nicolas Cage, you find most of the images with his eyes open, right? The images are, you know, good portrait images. We don't usually put someone, an image of a photograph of someone's eye closed as, as a, port, a good image on internet. And that is a bias in the training data. And that bias is inherited by the model. And then when the model synthesizes uh, new faces, it, it cannot synthesize, the models cannot generate something that they have no knowledge about. Um, so we're all kind of targeting that fundamental limitation of learning algorithms. So I, this is a very simple cue. So we just use a blinking detection uh, algorithm and then we can reveal, you know, quite reliably which one are fake and which are real. Um, but, but like I said, I mean, there's always some kind of countermeasures. Um, and this kind of method was actually pretty quickly um, uh, being noticed and uh, they, they started to train their models using videos and then blinking becomes a lot more natural in the subsequent generations of deepfakes. Um, and then we, 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 we tack another, I don't really have a lot of time to talk about this, but we use, we, it's, it's like a cat and mouse game. So they become a little better in generation. We look for something that is more fundamental, harder to beat. So another cue we have is this um, face orientation because the face are splicing in. So the face 
when, when the heart move around in the 3D world, the face does not move the same way as the head because it was not physically you know, part of the head. So we, we have an algorithm detecting that subtle differences between the orientations estimated from the whole head and the orientations estimated using only the, the inner part of the face. And we saw that deep fake videos tend to have a large error there because you know this physical inconsistency. Um, so we combine some of these uh, detection methods. We provide this um, as an algorithm. So you know, uh, and tested on deep fake videos created with third party uh, third party tools, and uh, we can collect it from the internet. And and, and the methods seem to work uh, pretty reliably. Uh, and I, one thing I want to mention is, you know, this probably is of more interest to this uh, community. Uh, we noticed that, you know, we have a, quite a few good detection algorithms on the market, uh, well, on GitHub's, but they are not really accessible to ordinary users. Um, these are all meant for programmers. You know, you have a GitHub, GitHub repository to analyze some media. You need to, you know, get that, get to the GitHub, you know, access the code, download to your computer, set up the environment and compile it, and then, you know, run and make sure no bug have, it has no bug, and then, you know, apply this to the media you're interested in. So for general, for, for, tip, for ordinary users, this is a lot of hassle. They don't really want to do this. And, uh, and, 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 and that's why, you know, the tools have not really reached the hands uh, that they, they were intended to be used. So, uh, there are some uh, uh, commercial uh, companies providing this kind of services, um, but many of them under a charge model. So you have to pay for the service and uh, they're usually running proprietary uh, 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 code, which, you know, again, another black, uh, black box, uh, we don't know. So for, for that purpose, we provide this model, this platform called Difficult Meter. Um, it's right now hosted on UB website uh, under my, my wife's uh, uh, server. Uh, what are we trying to do here is basically build a platform that in, on one side to the programmers, we provide API so everybody develop some, anybody develop some uh, defect detection algorithm can write their algorithm into um, our API and plug into this platform. And for the user is a web-based simple, simple interface. You can just upload a media there and then choose whatever uh, analysis you want to run on that media and then that will you will run this in the back in the, in the back end and uh, um, and, and send the results back so so this platform you know it's uh, we're a university so we don't really have a lot of manpower to maintain it but it seems to be you know uh, gaining some attention and people actually start to use this platform at least you know for for their own purposes um, and uh, I want to say, I talk a lot about detection, but detection, no matter what kind of detection we're dealing with, detection have a common problem that is they're always kind of post-modern analysis. Um, it, it can only be applied when something already show up online and you know, it exists for a while and people start to question their, uh, their, their authenticity. Then you, we apply detection there. So that window between it first showed up and then being analyzed by detector, some damage may, ha may already have caused, right? In, in, in the case of the revenge pornographic uh, case I was involved in, you know, just five minutes against like, you know, a couple thousands of views and that's already, you know, a lot of damages and, 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 and has caused. So we want to be more preemptive um, in this sense. We want to do something that we can in the, in, at, the first, at the first step, um, you know, de deter or intimidate um, the uh, the generators, the creators of deepfakes. So that's the kind of complementary technology my, my lab has also been interested in. So one idea we one idea is based on polluting the training data. So we what, what we're trying to do here is um, um, add some uh, less notable uh, uh, patterns into images, videos, or audios we are going to upload to social media. Um, and uh, this perturbation will not cause huge visual artifacts for human viewers. But when someone download those data and secretly train a model and generate fakes for us, 
the gen the create the, the those perturbations will will uh, slow down or even destroy the training process. So either the training will not converge or converge much slow slowly. Or if it ever converges, it creates a model that can only generate garbage instead of you know real looking faces. So that we call it as the proactive obstruction uh, approach. The other approach is to make the fake media tra uh, traceable. So here we also embed something into the um, uh, the media um, into into the media we're gonna upload. But instead of you know affecting the training process, we just secretly add those traces, bypass the training process, and be learned by the model as a feature from data. So when, when somebody uses those models to create samples, the sample will also inherit those kind of traces. And then we can look at those traces and make sure these are actually synthetic media. So in, in a sense, we call this as a radioactive. So make our training data radioactive, carrying those traces so that we can you know, later on reveal uh, if if some of the samples are actually created from the data, you know, um, uh, with those traces. So we, we, we hope this kind of measures uh, will not only help us to prevent uh, or uh, slow down the generation of deep, deep fakes, but also, you know, make them think twice, make, you know, kind of causing an intimidation uh, fact when, when they download some data, they need to think twice, you know, whether the data has been traced or, you know, um, uh, processed. Um, but I think you know, the future is like you know it, the the um, the competition between generation and detection or other content measures is going to be perpetual. Uh, once the uh, Pandora's box Pandora's box is open, it can never be put back. Um, and and in the next few years, I my prediction is we're going we're only going to see more development of synthetic media. Uh, so it will go from you know, simply faces or voices to whole body synthesis to voice and to audio and video, uh, you know, joint audio video gen uh, uh, generation. Um, and also it probably will require less training data, you know, instead of, you know, need thousands of images or um, a minutes long videos to train, maybe just image is fine. You know, we can create animation um, uh, based on one single image someone's uh, of some some subjects and we can create an, an animation there and we can also create non-human objects you know beyond just human faces um it could be natural scenes could be real objects even people talk about you know these days creating a whole 3d scene um using uh AI algorithm so i think the uh, the possibility is just infinite and it's it's actually you know posing a more challenge to the uh, uh, forensic community. So, I think you know, in summary, this this and this um, uh, AI algorithms are now making the the generation of fake media and manipulation of media much easier, and they're really causing uh, causing cause real life damages. And uh, we develop some forensic techniques to obstruct this uh, AI synthesized fake media by detecting them by you know stopping them slow and slow them down um but this is the, but but this um uh competition between making of defects and detect and, and forensics is going to be perpetual um i i think it's it, i don't see a winning winning side in near future um but i think the um um, that the long-term uh, long-term perspective is we're gonna reach a certain level of equilibrium. Uh, we're gonna coexist with fake media. We just need to be, you know, better prepared and educated with them. And that effort actually requires a, a joint um, a joint force across all walks of life. You know, government agencies play a role here. Public media plat platform company, especially, you know, needs to. Uh, put measures uh, for those particularly, you know, um, um, uh, offensive uh, fake media, and also users. All the users need to increase their vigilance uh, towards this. Now, last but not least, I want to mention that you know we talk about deep fakes, but there are also shadow fakes. The shadow fakes are you know uh, media manipulated with non-AI technologies, Photoshop of an image, you know, slow down or faster. Um, a video 
that can also cause a lot of uh, uh, misleading um, effects. And we should also, and, and they are easier to make. Uh, they probably cause they're they're probably causing you know if not worse as at, at least as bad as you know uh, those effects those um, impacts negative impacts as defects. So we don't want to forget them and we want to treat this whole problem as you know um, um, a general challenge for for everyone um, in this new century. You know how we you know um, how can we ensure the quality of the information we get on the social media and uh, at the same time not throttle the um, um, uh, the flu the, the 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 spread of information and you know the uh, the the high the community uh, between between us. All right. So uh, that's what um, I'm happy to take take a few questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, I see a question from Nirit. Nirit, do you want to unmute yourself and ask directly? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so actually, my first question was, uh, if uh, is it, it are GAN are like GAN architectures what are used to train like deep fake generators? And if so, uh, how well do the discriminator components of those of like the, the the training system? How well do they perform in in like actually classifying deep deep fakes? Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. So um, I'm assuming everybody everybody know about the GAN. Model so, but just just in the nutshell again, I didn't talk about this. I have a slide for this actually. So let me bring it up. Maybe uh, that's easier. Just give me one sec. Here we go. So the GAN model basically is composed by a pair of neural network models. One is called the generator. The other is the discriminator. So they compete uh, to make better generation of images. And, and the generator basically is take random noise and create a fake, uh, a, 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 a synthesized face. And the discriminator just judge between a real face and a synthetic face and decide which one is real and which one is, which one is fake. And then they kind of, com they, they kind of compete with each other in, in this kind of game um, uh, and, and both improve in that sense. Now, <clears throat> so uh, your question is, can we just take the discriminator as a detector, right? Yeah, so that's a very fair point. A lot of people ask about it. My, our experience with GAN is um, this model uh, is, is, is that the, the, the short answer to the question is usually not. Um, the reason is the discriminator is trained in this, comp, this kind of mutual computation way. So it, it doesn't, the, the end of this game is not a place where the generator uh, wins or the discriminator wins is actually reaching a compromise. So in the mean, in the sense that you know none of them actually do a terrific job, but they're all kind of agree that we don't want to push push any further because that's you know not 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 the uh, for the mutual benefit. So in that sense, and usually the generator stops at, at a place where the discriminator just give up. So when we actually test the discriminator. Unless it's on the same GAN model, same model train, its performance is usually, you know, quite miserable. Uh, even on the same model, it's just usually about, you know, seventy percent. Um, and and the state of our model is close to perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Nirch, you had another question. Do you want to ask it? Oh yeah, actually, it was related to Tuyan's question. I guess Tuyan left, but um, he had to go. But so his question was basically, you know, what are, is there a regress criterion to say whether something is fake or something is not fake? And then my question was related to that is uh, how do deep fake classifiers perform on, you know, something photoshopped, like, you know, on a magazine cover or something? It's like a genuine image, but it's doctored, right? So I, I, those are the two related questions. that we have. Good question. Um, there are two parts of your question. The first one is the definition. What do we define? How do we define real and fake? And secondly, um, you know, are the deepfake models uh, generalizable to other type of manipulations? I, I, the, the, the second one is easier, so I answer that first. Um, the answer is no. Um, the, the, the problem is forensics is um, we're dealing with a very, this is a real life problem. We're dealing with a very diverse uh, range of uh, problems. So methods typically, you know, focusing on artifacts 
that are specific to one type of manipulation. So defect detection algorithm, well, you know, nobody have tried this, but I, I don't, you know, I, I've been working all this methods. My kind of estimate is, is it probably will not work very well. Um, uh, and and uh, there were actually efforts to kind of unify all these detections, but it doesn't work very well. Um, it, it's just a problem requires a tool, a set of tools, not just any single, there's no single tool can solve all the problems. Your first question, your first point is very interesting because that's really something, you know, uh, almost reached to a philosophical level. Uh, what do we mean by real? What do, we mean, what do we mean by fake, right? I mean, if you think about this, even the, the, the images we call real images, they're actually not real. Um, you, you take a photo with your, with your phone, um, it's a color RGB photograph, right? But if you know in the in the in the camera, there's this thing called the a color filter array, which you know you use one sensor give you three color channels, and the trick they use there is one one of the uh, one pixel only sensed in one channel, and then you use interpolation to figure out all the other missing channels for the other locations. So in that sense, you know for all the practically all the photographs we are looking at, two thirds of the pixels are actually made up. Um, and, and they're, you know, do we call those real or fake? I mean, that's really hard to say, right? So I think, I think that's, that's really, you know, it's, it's a, it's a kind of philosophical question and, uh, it's like a kind of worm nobody want to open up, but I think we, we work in this area. Usually we take a working definition. So something we know for sure, you know, the, for the data set we use, we know for sure those are generated using AI algorithms so we can label them as fake. Uh, that's easy. But I think when we apply this in the real, in the real world, we need to be very, very cautious about interpreting those results. So that's why you know it's it's always good to understand what is going on inside the algorithm, other than you know just hand off say you know the algorithm tell me something. Right? Yeah, good point. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your answer, and thanks uh, to Anne for your question. Um, Mike, do you want to ask your question about? Um, how uh, how to prevent an adversary in uh... Uh, yeah uh, so uh, the idea is uh, what if an adversary decides to use uh, um, one of the one or more of the forensic models uh, as layers in the discriminator model so plug plug the forensic models into the gan and see what happens wouldn't that uh, uh, make detection uh, much more difficult uh yes in concept that's that that is possible um i'm not aware of anybody really try that um we have some experience we did that um just for our own curiosity um it turns out i mean in concept that will work and that's exactly by the way what happens you know uh with the actual human practice you know we come up with a detection algorithm we notice that blinking is the telltale sign of defects and then people come up with ideas to fix it, right? They, they, they follow the sign, they follow the detection to improve their generation. And then we find something else and they probably will fix another round. So this, this is a cat and mouse game. Um, but in terms of, in, 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 when we're implementing this in a GAN model, um, it, it doesn't work very well for, uh, for the reason that first of all, GAN is, as I said, is a game. So they they just they stop the game at a place where there's no incentive for you know either side to further improve. So um, it turns out that when you put a lot of class uh, discriminator uh, into the you, you put a combined nation of discriminator there, they just do a lousy job. You know, satisfying uh, a majority of them, then you can still use an individual classifier to find those artifacts. So we do have an experiment doing that. But it's a negative result we didn't publish anywhere. Um, so, so practically implementing this with the GAN architecture is difficult. I think what you described in, in concept is completely, you know, is, is exactly what happened um, uh, uh, you know, for the human practice. Now, I don't think there is any possibility that we can totally kill off the uh, uh, this kind of adversarial. Um, um, reactions. Um, part of the reason is we actually open source all the detection code. So, you know, the uh, uh, people who are generating this, 
they are they're gonna they're gonna have access to the detection model and they can study it and they can you know find ways to beat it right um but on the other hand i think you know this doesn't mean that we should you know uh, make the detection code not open source i somebody said you know sun sunlight is the best disinfection right uh so make it open source actually make it more reliable um and um and and also this when was you know i got a lot of you know almost every time somebody asked him about, about this you know a uh, sort of like a upload clip this kind of scenario where you know since the generators always get a upper hand are we kind of see are we doomed in in this competition uh, i think when we consider this we meet one important factor here is the users the users are actually getting smarter so we have the detection tools and the users are becoming more vigilant that is what i meant what i mean by you know in the long run we're going to reach this equilibrium where somebody if they really want to i still believe at any given time there will be someone dedicated to throw in a lot of money and resource make a huge um make make a very highly realistic deep fake media video image or audio that nobody can tell no algorithm can tell apart but to reach that level it means a large a, a, a large amount of resources need to be spent there what are we trying to do here is just to raise that bar we don't want people you know who can just randomly you know find a find a code online and get some data and train a the model then can can generate something that the whole world baffled uh, are baffled we want we want this to be more difficult um and, and and that narrows down who can do it and maybe easier to you know uh tell who has you know who's behind this right so that's that's the hope so um not not a complete satisfactory answer to the question but i think that's the reality you know? Uh, I see a question Neeraj asked when you were describing about detecting uh, I, I think I think actually CUA already answered about the ethical of, uh, considerations of open source, right? That one? No, no, I, I, uh, the, 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 the face differences between authentic audio. Uh, but I think Eric had a question because we're running out of time. So let's answer oh, our next question. Okay, hold yeah. on. Okay, okay. Eric, I see your question. Oh, yeah. I I was wondering, um, it seems like the, there, as you described, there's a bit of an arms race between the, the um, you know, the um, detect, detectors and the, um, and the fakers. And I was wondering what you thought about trying to get ahead of the problem by maybe um, signing the content in the first place in a way that the, if the content is, is modified in any way, then, then the signature would be invalidated. And 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 that way, you know, if it's not properly signed, you know, people can know that they can't really trust it. I was just wondering if, if you thought about that, and and um, could that be another way to address this problem? Yes, um, actually, yeah, that's that's actually one way we study. So this uh, this traceable idea is along that lines. But uh, you know, what you described is. Um, more conventionally in media forensics, we call it digital watermarks. Um, so it's like a watermark in the bill. Um, and digital watermarks are usually for authentic media. So you put in the authentic media and then something changed. Uh, you can, uh, some manipulation, some operation done on those images, on those videos, um, the, um, the watermark will be disrupted and you can detect that. Um, and, and the other more, I think, recent way of doing that is using this, uh, what I call it controlled capture. Uh, so a company called TruePeak is doing that. So instead of imbibing watermarks, they extract some unique characteristics from the, from the media, store it somewhere uh, on cloud safely. And then when the media show up again, you, you extract the same fingerprint and compare with the fingerprint you stored and see if they have been manipulated. Um, we, we go, we, we initially we try that way. And the problem with watermarks or control capture is, you know, they, they only protect the authentic media. So when you act, so this thing does not exist when you, um, it, 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 can, it can be destroyed when you take the images, take the media and use, use them as training data for a model. And when the model starts generating samples, the, uh, the watermarks are not there. So, and, uh, and, and the watermarks can be removed. So it's, it, it's, 
it's, it's, it becomes less effective as it tended to be. So what are we trying to design here is a sort of watermark, but it's robust to the training process. So um, it'd be carried over into the samples generated from the model. Okay, yeah. got you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, I sort of have follow-up question. So why, let's say, Facebook uh, haven't already put, you know, uh, those detectors in real time, you know, some if someone posted like uh, a fake uh, doctored uh, image, so the detector in real time can detect or, you know, at least flag that, okay, this is suspicious image and then human can also, uh, you know, yeah. Very that, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I really don't, I, I don't, you know, I don't work at Facebook. I don't really know why they didn't do that, um, uh, which I think they should. Um, and they probably did, but it just, they, you know, they may have that and that kind of analysis, but they, they just don't reveal to us, uh, to the public, they're doing that. But there is really one tricky issue uh, in doing so. Uh, you know, apart from all those, you know, ethical, whatever uh, uh, reasons, there's kind of like one human factor uh, playing here. There was a study last year showing that, you know, you can run a detection algorithm and you see a fake media, you label it as deep fake. So the intention is to say, we said, the intention is to say, you know, label this as something fake, then stop people, stop people from distributing it, stop people from you know, really, you know, looking at it, but it has exactly the opposite effect because human are curious. Human like to see something that is outrage, prohibited, uh, yeah. sensible, yeah. sensational, right? And uh, and and I think somebody say say this. I, I like that quote. Like truth is boring. <laughs> uh, uh, fake things are more exciting, right? So so we when, when we put the label, say this is deep fake. They actually do this. I think somebody actually did this study. The the the, the likelihood is that someone will actually watch this and redistribute this is actually higher. Um, so I think you know. So that's one thing I you know I learned throughout my work is we cannot just focus on the tech and technology side of the problem. There's a huge human factor here because everything is intended to be used by humans. And humans are the victims of this kind of uh, deceptions. You know, we, 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 a comprehensive solution need to come. Need to consider all these factors there. So, um, I, I don't know if these are the specific concerns of Facebook, but they're definitely one thing we should be mindful uh, in practice uh, using this mm -hmm. technology. Yep. Okay, sounds sounds great. Um, it was it was great having you, Xiuwei. Thanks a lot for amazing presentation. Um, if uh, guys, if you haven't uh, joined Bugout Slack, please do. Uh, we will post a video recording and also we can post presentation, right? Uh, Huey, if someone wants to connect with you, um, can I provide your email as well? If someone of course. Wants to... okay. Definitely, yes. So well, let me know if you want to connect to Huey. And yeah, it's, it was amazing to have you here. And thanks a lot, guys, for your uh, questions. Um, thanks a yeah. lot and uh, see you on the next uh, bug out meetup. Thank you very much and have a nice day.